Music can be beautiful. Music can also sound like this. But even in the most egregious dissonances, there are relationships to hear. There are particular tensions that suggest particular resolutions. There are expectations being met or unmet. Dissonance can express the chaos of the natural world. And if you really listen, dissonance can reveal how order emerges from that chaos. This constant tug of war between chaos and order, dissonance and consonance, is where composers of music have sought out meaning for hundreds of years. It's where we can express all the complexity at the heart of the human spirit, the ambiguity, the indecision, the struggle, the resilience. You might think that this kind of depth of feeling and thought is the exclusive purview of the great classical and jazz musicians of history. You might think that this kind of complexity could never exist somewhere like a Broadway musical. But if you think that, it might mean you're not really listening. This video is going to be about Stephen Sondheim, the great musical theater composer. But before we talk about Sondheim, we have to talk about Beethoven. Uh, not that Beethoven. That Beethoven. When I'm not making YouTube videos, I teach piano lessons. When students come to me, many of them six years old or younger, they already know about Beethoven. They might not know his name, but every single one of them lights up with recognition when they hear the first four notes of his fifth symphony. Or the opening of Fur Elise. Or his setting of the Ode to Joy. Most of my kids don't come from musical families, so I have no idea where or how they hear these melodies. Beethoven is so famous that his music is just kind of in the air. But as big of a deal as he is today, he was an even bigger deal in 1876. This was the year that Johannes Brahms premiered his first symphony. An enormous success which was immediately met with comparisons to the late Beethoven. It was an association that must have brought him great pride, but it was also, in many ways, a burden. This burden is one that was felt by the entire generation of composers who followed Beethoven. Beethoven was a true innovator, utilizing longer melodies, more diverse orchestrations, more dissonant harmonies, and more complex structures than his classical contemporaries. His music was so innovative that his third symphony is now considered the beginning of the Romantic era in music. Hector Berlioz said, Beethoven opened before me a new world of music. It was up to his successors to explore that new world. And explore they did. The Romantic movement grew up in the wake of the industrialization of Europe, the French Revolution, and the emergence of the modern middle class. People were hungry for new ideas, and had the wealth and leisure time to engage with them. In the Romantic era, not only were there composers ready to explore the new world that Beethoven had revealed, there were paying audiences ready to go with them. The 50 years after Beethoven's death in 1827 were an incredible period in European art music. In addition to the monumental symphonies of Brahms and Berlioz, there were Wagner's great operas, Rimsky-Korsakov's dazzling orchestrations, Liszt's brilliant and unprecedented piano work, Beethoven was a rare combination of things. Not only was he an incredible artist with an incredible intellect, 
He was also uniquely suited to his medium and his time period. In the history of music, I can think of only a few other artists who achieved this kind of generation-defining artistic success. In jazz music, it's Miles Davis. In rock and roll, it's the Beatles. And in musical theater, it's Stephen Sondheim. If you ask someone working in musical theater today who their favorite composer is, there's a good chance they'll say something like, you mean other than Sondheim? These days his genius is universally acknowledged. But there was of course a time when his place in the Pantheon was not a given. In 1957, he was a young hotshot making his Broadway debut as the lyricist for the beloved and acclaimed musical West Side Story. It was a powerful debut, and hinted at the brilliance to come. But for most of his ensuing career, the reception of his work would be more mixed. Sondheim's musicals, despite the obvious vision and craft behind them, can be difficult for audiences to hear and process. They're sometimes criticized for not being hummable. But I believe the roots of this difficulty are actually the same as the roots of his brilliance. Much like Beethoven, Sondheim incorporates more dissonance and innovative harmony than is usually heard in musical theater. When he decided to seriously study compositional technique, he found his mentor in Milton Babbitt, a composer of avant-garde concert music. Though Sondheim never embraced atonality like Babbitt did, his music does incorporate dissonances that have their precedent in 20th century composers like Ravel and Stravinsky. In contrast to the vast majority of theater music, Sondheim often writes harmonies that can't be analyzed as simple major and minor chords. On top of this, the way that music interacts with the storytelling in his work is different from what many theater audiences expect. In an old school musical comedy, the dialogue and music would develop as two separate entities. The action of the plot would often stop to make room for a musical number, and the songs could generally be appreciated separate from the story, reimagined as jazz standards or parlor songs. This started to change through the efforts of Oscar Hammerstein, who, along with his collaborators Jerome Kern and Richard Rogers, began to write shows with more complex stories, where the music and lyrics were just as integral to the plot as the dialogue was. While many other composers continued to write pop-oriented show tunes that could easily have a life outside of the shows they were written for, Sondheim built on the innovations of Hammerstein, blending song and dialogue to the point that they sometimes become indistinguishable, and mixed in the influence of opera composers like Richard Wagner, developing musical ideas across an entire work rather than packaging them into individual songs. In Sunday in the Park with George, for example, the words and melody of the show's climax reflect a moment from the end of the first act. The musical idea is seeded early on and developed throughout the show. I have to move on. In the end, though, all of these facets of Sondheim's work are style choices. The true source of his brilliance goes so much deeper to the heart of his agenda as an artist an agenda that is inextricably tied to the birth of the art form he loved. Ask a historian when the musical was born, and there's a good chance they will point to 1927's Showboat, the first musical comedy to fully integrate song and story, or 1943's Oklahoma, the Pulitzer-winning first collaboration between Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein. But I think the true birth of the musical came a couple years later in Rogers and Hammerstein's Carousel, specifically in a moment now referred to as the bench scene. In this scene, two characters insist to each other that they are not in love, all the while singing a soaring, romantic melody. A melody that lets the audience in on the fact that, well, you can hear it for yourself. (laughs) 
If you ask someone who doesn't like musical theater what they don't like about it, the most common response you'll get is that musicals are corny or over the top. And speaking as someone who actually enjoys musicals, those people kind of have a point. When you have dialogue, acting, music, lyrics, and dance all pointing toward the same thing, expressing the same emotion, the ultimate effect can be overstimulating, kind of sickly sweet. The bench scene was the first moment in theater history to solve this problem. Instead of music that expresses what the lyrics and dialogue are already saying, we have music that expresses what the characters cannot let themselves say. The song isn't built to instill a particular feeling in the audience. It's built to tell us more about the people on stage before us. It acts as a kind of prism, freezing the moment and refracting the colors of a character's psyche out for the audience to see. Musical theater has a reputation for being simplistic, but when it's done right, the genre is an incredible vehicle for emotional ambiguity and psychological complexity. Sondheim understood this better than any other composer. While Rodgers and Hammerstein scratched the surface of this phenomenon, Sondheim made it the central tenet of his work, always seeking out moments of ambivalence, ambiguity, indecision, and irony. And so we get the most triumphant and the most heartbreaking moments of a story infused with the same melody. We get beautiful music for hideous moments. We get a witch as a truth teller. We get a man opening his heart up to romantic love while completely alone on stage. We get a world on stage that is as messy, as complicated as the one we actually live in. For these and many other reasons, Sondheim is revered in the musical theater community. Like Beethoven before him, he opened the door into a new world for his art form. But what happens when an artist opens a door and the world fails to walk through? In 1983, a Broadway producer named Judy Kramer met the composers Bjorn Olveus and Benny Anderson. At the time, they were working on a musical called Chess, but they were much more famous for the decade they spent as half of the Swedish pop supergroup ABBA. While listening to the songs they were writing for Chess, Kramer also started to hear the theatrical potential in the songs they had written with ABBA. Something from that meeting stuck with Kramer. And after 16 years of gestating, the musical Mamma Mia was born. Mama Mia, now I really know. It was a smash hit. The songs were great, and the story was cute, but more importantly, because ABBA were already superstar hit makers, the show had a built-in audience. Tourists and locals who already knew and loved the songs flocked to the original West End production. A production so popular that it is still running today, 24 years later. Mamma Mia was not the first jukebox musical, but its enormous success definitely had an influence on show business in New York and London. More and more producers came to the realization that building shows out of existing IP is a surefire way to make boatloads of money. If you're in New York right now, there are 23 Broadway musicals that you can see. Of those 23, four are jukebox musicals, seven are adaptations of popular blockbuster movies, five are long-running hits, and two are revivals. That leaves just five musicals that could be called original. If you're looking for the kind of psychological complexity that Rodgers and Hammerstein pioneered and Sondheim perfected, the number is even smaller. Sondheim is constantly heralded as the most important and influential figure in the art form. But when I look at the musical theater landscape, I have to ask, where exactly is his influence? Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Sondheim is that he managed to have a career at all. Despite now being regarded as masterpieces, Company, Follies, Sweeney Todd, and Sunday in the Park with George all lost money on their original Broadway runs. Passion was divisive, closing after just a few months, and Merrily We Roll Along was an outright flop, closing after just two weeks. And yet, for the six decades of his career, Producers were willing to take risk after risk on his work. Audiences were willing to spend time with the soundtracks and come back for revival productions. Directors were willing to study his music and lyrics and champion them. Creating great work takes bravery, not just from the artists, but from audiences and producers as well. Where is that bravery today? 
There are probably dozens of young composers waiting in the wings, ready to take the next big leap, to dazzle and challenge audiences with their innovations, and hold up a mirror to society. Is anyone going to give them their chance? In the last two years before his death, Beethoven focused most of his energy on a series of string quartets. They are among his most complex and innovative compositions. When they were premiered, even the musicians who played them were befuddled. One is reported to have said, We know there is something there, but we do not know what it is. It took time and effort to unpack what Beethoven had created. But his late string quartets are now widely held to be among the all-time greatest works of classical music. Sondheim, too, was hard at work composing all the way until his final days. When he died in November 2021, he left behind an unfinished musical that he was writing with the playwright David Ives. Like a lot of other nerds, I had been following the development of this musical for years, ever since 2014, when Sondheim first mentioned in a New Yorker interview that he was working on something new. On the day that he passed, mixed in with all the other heartbreak was the realization that we might never get to hear this final work, almost a decade in the making. That turned out not to be true. I don't know how close to finished the score and script were, but somehow David Ives and his other collaborators were able to create a complete musical out of the material that was left behind. Here We Are started previews last month and opened off-Broadway earlier this week. Sometime in the evening, on October 22nd, the cast took their opening night curtain call and the massive, sprawling chapter of musical theater history that is Stephen Sondheim came to a close. His contribution is now complete. It will be up to the rest of us to write what comes next. What do we make out of what he left us? How do we deal with the legacy of someone so radical, so thoughtful, so emotional, so uncompromising? I believe the only answer is to do what he did, to seek out uncharted territory. For artists, this means reaching past convention to find new modes of expression. For producers, this means championing new, challenging voices, even at the risk of financial failure. And for audiences, this means coming to the theater with open ears and open hearts, ready to engage with an art form with a rich tradition and a universe of potential. I already have my tickets for Here We Are. And when the lights go down at the Griffin Theater and the orchestra picks up, that is what I plan to do. I can't imagine what new doors Sondheim's final musical is going to open for us. But whatever they are, I wish us all the courage to walk through them. <laughs> <laughs>